What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and welcome to, uh, I guess right now it's called a Reviewer Bits video. You know, I think I'm going to change the title of all these videos to something like Game Design Bits, because that's really what I end up talking about, even though I'm coming at it from a reviewer standpoint. But I'm sitting here getting the tires changed on my car, and I was like, I need to start recording remotely more, because I do end up traveling a lot, I end up moving around a lot, and I don't do a lot of recording live when I get a chance out and about anymore. I used to do it a little bit more, but I think I'm going to try and see how it goes here today. So what I want to talk about today, of all things, is actually, you know, NPCs, tertiary, secondary characters, and how they come about within titles, a little bit about what I like and dislike and what I see in games that I review, but then also maybe talk a little bit about the development phases behind it and why we might see some problems with some games that we don't see with others, and maybe a little bit of engine development in there as well. You know, I think when you're talking about these kind of characters, you have to talk about the games that do it well, don't do it well, what the issues have been in the past, and when you look at games that have done it well. I mean, I think we all look at Witcher 3 as possibly being one of the better games with NPCs. You know, I've had issues in the past where I've talked about some of the sound effects, uh, some of the vocal cues, some of the things they do are a bit repetitive, but really that s separation between church and state, between the main character and the secondary and tertiary characters and what they affect and what they impact is actually really well done for the most part in Witcher 3. And I think when you look at what's going on in Witcher 3, and I don't know what footage I'm going to put here, but when you really look at a situation like Witcher 3, Three, and you start to see it develop and you start to see your, you know, as Geralt, you're walking around, you start to see these worlds develop. I think there's a couple things that we notice that are done well in all games and are a little bit bigger impactors in games than other specific aspects. For example, I think really when it comes down to their actions, what they're doing, you know, we've seen games like Two Worlds, which did have a lot of NPCs. It wasn't the greatest game, but let's not talk about that for a second. Let's just talk about how it handled its secondary and tertiary gaming systems through its NPCs. They actually didn't do anything for the most part. They were almost always just standing there. Now, you've probably seen me in other podcasts that I've done call that the status of stasis. And that's really what I believe. I believe that when you don't see those characters moving, it really doesn't lend itself to an atmosphere of actual action, an atmosphere of being lived in and being breathed in. For example, when I did the walk in the walk and we took a look at L.A. Noir. Now, L.A. Noir is not the greatest open world title. In fact, it's not really a very, very good open world title. It's passable and it's got some issues. But one thing that it actually does is it consistently has people moving around about you different during the day than the night that kind of thing but you get this feeling that things are actually occurring around you even if they are at their very most basic there's a huge difference between static characters that you see and moving ones we've seen this in a lot of mmos in fact where depending on the amount of people within a game area and a town you end up getting this situation where you have an elevation or a descending of the amount of people moving around within that town so sometimes when you enter a town it feels really busy and other times of course you enter a town and it feels like there's not a lot of busyness going on there's not a lot of action and it's crazy when I talk to developers and I ask them, you know, how do they handle their secondary systems? How do they handle their NPC systems? And really, it's it's strange when you hear that a lot of people actually looked at Bethesda and did look at their job queuing system as a new way to do things. And you actually do see more games going away from the static characters to a more lived in style of their character generation for their NPCs, for the secondary and tertiary characters. And though they're not quite great in all games, and I certainly haven't seen MMOs sort of take it that next step up. It really does show, I think to me at least, that the number one thing that matters is action. And it's it's something that whenever I'm looking at a game, whenever I'm playing a game, an old game, a new game, what have you, if I enter a town and no one's moving but me, it always feels like a still painting that occasionally has voices come out of the portraits that you click on. You know, as I'm sitting here thinking about other games that did it well, I think Red Dead did it well. Now, Red Dead had some issues with some other categories I'm going to try to cover here. But in one category where I felt they did a good job was action. And yes, at times, especially especially in the thieves landing area, it could get a little busy, but at minimum, you always felt like something was going on, maybe a little too much, right? Maybe sometimes you were like, okay, listen, if everybody gets robbed, no one would ever be here. But when you look at that situation and you feel that game world, it feels like it's action packed. And especially in a smaller game world with a smaller number of NPCs in a Western world with no real motor vehicles or quicker transport to really take you anywhere, except for of course the horses, I actually felt like they did a good job with the action. Again, there were some issues elsewhere, but but when you look at games that handle it well and do a good job, I think that's one of them. You know, one of the issues I had with The Elder Scrolls Online, even though I really actually enjoy exploring in that game, is 
once again, you enter a world where there isn't a lot of movement. Now, some of the characters move, but a lot of them don't. And so you have that situation where you enter a place and no one's moving around. Now, people have asked me before, especially when I talk about action in podcasts and people have asked me my thoughts on MMOs in particular, but how would you handle it if a character, let's say, would give a quest and it isn't there? And so you show up and you've got that character in a movement system or a queuing or a job system or people try to game the system and block them. Well, there's different ways to do that. I'm not saying that the character has to be leaping Lenny Poffo off the top of freaking stalls onto people's heads. But let's say you have a stall that's closed off. He's got a large area with some stuff behind him. Let's say some equipment. That character could be pacing, walking, moving around, grabbing items, sharpening them, polishing swords, all behind an area that was completely cut off from anybody actually getting into, but still showed some action on that character's part. There's little things like that that a lot of developers, when we talk, you know, you'll sometimes hear them talking about, this is something we put but we didn't have the resources. This is something we wanted to do, but we didn't have the resources. I think as we move forward and we get more and more uh, expertise from gamers as game developers, we're going to start seeing those kind of things happen more and more where there's that one extra step of action within the environment when it comes to the, those secondary and tertiary characters. And then the next thing I want to talk about, you know, action, of course, being super important to me, the, the next is, strangely enough, n not realism or anything like that. It's actually their appearance. And I think really you can look at this in two different ways where two games handled it differently and one failed, I think, utterly and the other did a, a, a pretty good job. One is Red Dead where you had a smaller number of people in every town and you had a smaller number of subset of clothing. So when you randomly generate somebody, just so everybody understands how this is happening, when you randomly generate somebody, you send a call into the game engine that says, okay, we need an NPC. And then it goes and it picks male. And then the moment it picks male, it removes all the female dress options which are usually flagged for gender. And then you have the male dress options and then it randomly picks them and then it puts those options on that character minus any issues, for example, if you've already chosen what action they're doing. So like if they're a, if they're a female on a horse, do you have them wear a dress and ride side saddle or do you have them wear some kind of pants and have them, have them ride normally? So you do have a couple little issues there. And then you spawn that character. So when you're looking at a game like Red Dead, it's surprising because you have this much smaller subset of ways they can dress. It is a drab or color scheme. And unless you see some of the ladies of the night kind of situations, or you see some of the finery that some of the characters wear, a lot of them are wearing what looks a little bit like the same stuff. Now there's some little miscellaneous items here and there that you may see bandoliers, uh, different belts, di different ways in which they carry their guns, different hats. So those all do a good job of sort of setting it off as we joke around and say, but uh, it, it's cr crazy when you see something like that with less people. And then you look at a game like Unity. Now Unity has been patched a couple times, but Unity, as you saw, my review had an issue where like everybody's hats would switch five feet away from them and that kind of thing. And you have a situation where it's obvious that they pushed that engine prior to it being ready and they pushed it too hard and they asked it to draw too many characters and they got a lot of repetition. And I think repetition is a far larger atmosphere killer than any kind of other less characters should be here kind of situation. So if you walk into, let's say, a marketplace and you see 40 people that look well realized and they're moving about somewhat realistically, that area will intrinsically feel more lived in, alive, and realistic than if you saw 200 people and they were all wearing the same pants. In fact, one becomes not only a suspension of disbelief, but actually in some way a battle against your disbelief. You're not just suspending your disbelief that they would all be wearing the same pants. You're actually suspending your disbelief and you're actually having to sort of shore up your disbelief because everybody's wearing the same pants like some kind of attack of the body snatchers. And that's what I think happened in Unity. So you get these two types of games and Unity, I think we saw, if they had pared that down to 50%, you would have had a ton of people still on the streets and you would have had a lot less repetition and the game wouldn't have had such a large amount of overdraw. Now, people have asked me why I think that game in particular has those issues. And I think what's going on most likely is they were grabbing characters by group. And what happens is you can spawn a group of people in a game. You could basically call them group number three, and it makes it a little bit quicker. This group basically grabs this group and puts them down in particular places. You can also have them do particular things. You can assign them particular actions, just like you could normal uh, normal secondary and tertiary characters. I mean, when you really think about it, you could almost assume that it's like you could have one character chosen that is just doing jump rope, and then a little bit later, you could have three characters pop up that were doing double dutch. It's still the same general action, but it's a slightly different form, and there's more people in Involved. Another way to describe it is the marble example, which is let's say in your left hand you have three marbles and in your right hand you have three marbles. And 
in each hand, there is a single copy. There is a blue marble in your left hand and a blue marble in your right hand, but all the other marbles are unique. You could put those marbles down multiple times and never have the two blue marbles be next to each other, okay? So what happens in a randomly seeking engine like this, where it goes into the engine and grabs that code, what looks like happens in Unity is they didn't write code to verify next door neighbor likenesses. So what happens is they didn't say, okay, if you have two blue marbles, rearrange it one more time. And especially when you think about it from, look, from being on top and looking down at a crowd, and if you think of three marbles as maybe being the three points to a pyramid of some kind or, or, or something to that effect, then you can see how quickly you would start to see some repetition if you weren't watching for it. And that's pretty much what we see there. Now, is that 100% what's going on? I'm not sure. I don't know the game code. I don't know what they're doing there, but that is something that we've seen in the past and, and of course seen how it's popped up. So after shortly covering those two things, I think to me what matters the most really when I look at it or is a combination of realism and reaction. And these go hand in hand, so they're very difficult to sort of separate, but I'm going to try. When it comes to realism, one of the games that I really always brought forward as, as being really realistic, at least in their placement and overall actions and appearances, was of course Witcher 3. I thought that the secondary and tertiary characters there, all of those NPCs, felt like they were pretty much in the right place, and there was a realism to their locations. And so it, imagine you basically have the borders of a town, and your engine is going out there, and it's trying to seek some random actors, some random NPCs, and it knows, let's say, that the town is in the small uh, South Peninsula city. So what it can do is it can look at clothing and say, okay, we don't need the winter clothes, we need these specific clothes, and it can go ahead and it make an environment that seems at least somewhat realistic using those actors, using the clothes that they have, and possibly even a very, very basic version of genetics where they would say, okay, the a per, a personal type of hereditary uh, trait that goes through this area is blue eyes, whatever. So that's what we're going to have in this area. We're going to have a, a little bit more of them, whatever you may want to do in your engine. But I, one of the things I really did like about Witcher 3 is their separation of church and state. I'd spoken about this rural and urban, and I felt that their separation Separation, it wasn't as truncated as, let's say, an Elder Scrolls game where you walk out of town and you get three feet from town and people are just fucking killing each other instantly. It was a little bit more separated in Witcher 3, and I think that that really added to the realism that Witcher 3 offered because not only did you see... Uh, I guess a separation of church and state, like I said, or urban and rural, whichever way you want to say it, one of the things that I noticed, at least, is that it was it was very quickly that you felt like you were entering a town or you were exiting a town. There was a, a good border, and then there was a sort of a buffer zone where it felt like these characters were probably around the area killing off bad guys, whether they were or, or, or were not. What happens is the realism in placing those characters and understanding how far away, let's say, to place an enemy spawn generator really, really matters in these games, and it helps in the secondary and tertiary characters to make sure that they're not always battling it out. You know, I really like a lot of the Bethesda games. I think they're fun, bombastic titles. They are a little bit more like The Rock, though, when in, in, when it comes to movie titles, where you just jump in and, you know, you walk right outside of a town and people are just atom bombing each other. And that happens a little less with, with uh, Witcher 3. Not completely, but a little. So when it comes to realism and when it comes to their reactions, I think those are sort of hand in hand. That's some of the realism that I was really impressed with in various open world games. I've seen it. Mad Max, I actually thought there were some really realistic ways in which they put down characters around certain locations. And of course, you're not always seeing a shitter. You're not always seeing enough water and enough food. And I would love to see that in games. I would love to see them put stores up in games. And I don't mean a store like a Fred Meyer. I'm talking about stores as in, you know, storage of, of food. And we see that in a couple games, but I really like to see that in games. It's such a small, stupid addition, but a lot of people think when you're talking about an N NPC system, you're talking purely about the NPCs, but you really can't be, because when you start talking about their actions, well, what if they look in a storefront uh, like they did in L.A. Noir? Well, that storefront has to be there, right? So you have to talk about the environment in some way. What if they cross a street at a red light? What happens then? What happens if it's a green light? Do they get hit? Those kind of things. So it really does all have this interconnected weave of, of of interaction there where everybody has to make sure that every system is sort of working well. And that includes this realism and reactions. And then when it comes to reactions, one of the things 
that I think I like in some games, but I'm I'm starting to notice, especially that that sort of bothers me in particular ones. And we've talked about this in Skyrim. We joked a lot about it in Skyrim, and I think it's a meme now. But basically, the situation where you kill off two dragons, but you accidentally kick the chicken, and suddenly you're arrested for it. And you see these reactions that uh, that just aren't really inherently watching what's actually going on in the game. And I've talked about this with developers and said, you know, can there be a, why can't there be a buffer? Why can't there be a buffer of I, I killed a dragon one hour ago, so any of the small creatures or something like that, there's um, if I kill one, there's just no chance of being in trouble. If I kill two, there's a, a 10% chance, three, there's and it goes up from there or something like that. It's not a ton of things you need to do, and it's not a ton of extra programming, but what it does is adds a little bit of variability. And it seems like it would remove some of that unrealistic reaction we get. You know, when you add all these things together, the appearances, the actions, the realism, and the reactions, I think that's when you start getting these realistic characters. And it, it doesn't require a ton of work. We've seen it done fairly well in some games, and we see it a little crazy in others. But you see some games that are even older handling it pretty well, and then you see some games that are even coming out now that don't handle it well at all. And what I've always wished is that... You know, you see these things at GDC, you see these talks where people go and they talk about AI or they talk about their NPC party systems. And it, it, I always see developers at them, but I really don't see a lot of times where that more and more of those bad experiences are turned into learning experiences and turned into positive reactions in games later. And I've talked to a couple developers about it and said like, why is it that if we know this doesn't work and we saw it in games a year or, or five years ago, why are we still seeing it now? And, you know, a lot of times we'll hear things like resources. A lot of us like to believe this isn't true, but the fact is, is that when you're making a game, resources are such a big deal. And many times that can be the difference between a feature getting in and a feature just no one caring about because it doesn't, most people won't care about some particular thing. And it sort of saddens me because it's very difficult many times to quickly say if the NPC system is good in a game, it requires discussion. And because it re requires discussion, it's got a softer answer at the end. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's hard to sell somebody on the usefulness of taking care of these things up front. It's difficult to say, hey, we know it matters when somebody says, no, we know that 12 guns minimum need to be in the game. That's what matters. And it's a, it's one of those losing battles when you actually find out that maybe 12 guns does matter, but if people have 12 guns in a game and they run around and the game world is, is ultimately boring to them and the NPCs don't react realistically, they may have bought the game, but they may not play it very long and thus they are not invested or at the very least interested participants in your title, which of course is going to matter on your sequels, on your remasters, on your remastered sequels, and your your ultimate unbelievable insane limited unlimited editions so I, I think those are the things that i really look for again it's that appearances those actions that realism and the reactions of course all being separated a little bit it is strange that we see these games coming out so often where we're still having problems with the npc systems and especially when knowing how some of the information is is when is gathered from a game engine and plopped down in it is really stunning that we're still having problems even now after many, many years where we've some, seen some games come very, very close to doing it right. You know, I was talking to one person about AI and uh, they're an AI programmer for multiple AAA titles. And they were saying, you know, you hear this often. You hear that it is very difficult to write dumb AI. It's not difficult to write AI that's very intelligent because... You know, if you're doing anything on the game stream, the computer knows and it can always beat you. We can always set it up to beat you. And it's funny because when I asked about the job systems and the queuing systems for actions and how people interact and the mob mentalities uh, of, let's say, multiple people seeing uh, something happen in a GTA game and then running off to tell the cops, I was like, how does all this work? Why is it why is it that you can't make them seem smarter? And it was funny because they were saying that actually that's one of the caveats to the comment in that it's actually difficult to write them intelligently because the the, the way to make them appear intelligent, the way to make them appear real realistic is to add such a large degree of variability that sometimes they break the game systems. And, uh, you know, that's sad. I, I get it. I understand completely. But it's one of those situations where I would love to see more work and a little bit of a stretching of resources towards better mentalities, investigate flocking systems with uh, birds, with creatures, that we know that flock. You know, how does information get passed forth? We saw a little bit of this in Watch Dogs. We know that they studied a little bit of, of flocking behavior and how information is passed in large crowds that witness a single event. 
I would like to see some more of that. I would like to see some more situations where characters who notice something act in a realistic and lawful way. We see that in GTA. We see it in Watch Dogs where they freak the fuck out and sometimes, you know, just smash your car 80 times as they're trying to get away. Things like that where... Yeah, if somebody saw somebody shoot, would they smash through somebody else? They may They may just cower, too. And we don't see that as much. We don't see some of those other reactions. Usually, we just get one or two. And in some games, they just try to smash into you like a Saints Row, where they think that running over you is the best bet, which is probably my version. So anyway, those are my thoughts on just tertiary and secondary characters, NPC systems, and uh, something that popped into my head today. So I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Feel free to leave some comments. As always, please check out the patron. It always helps the channel. Sincerely helps out the channel. And enjoy the rest of your week.